It was more sad or not. It can be some technical disaster, you know. We didn't have any proofs, and I do believe that it's Iran who didn't want it to be Mossad, because if we could kill Iranian president, it would be like regional war. So let's say it could be some natural catastrophe or some technical disorder. It was pretty old helicopter, or like uh, some Hamas media say it was a uh, Israeli agent called helicopter. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, the only thing is weird is timing because uh, recently we have uh, listened about the Jewish guy that was about to be executed in Iran. Have you heard about this? I did, but I don't know exactly what the story was. What happened? So I do believe that this guy was killed somebody accidentally, and uh, they still have an old tradition that uh, if you killed somebody, you need or to be killed for this or to need to uh, buy your wife from the family. So this guy, Jewish uh, boy, Arvin Netanel Gahrimani, he lives in Iran and his family offer big uh, like bribe and big money for life of this guy the family didn't want to accept it so he was about to be executed previous shabbat previous saturday and then the death penalty was delayed delayed till the day yesterday delayed till sunday and uh, raisi ex-president of iran he had a nickname like tehranian butcher because he was butcher, uh -huh. butcher yeah he was uh a big fan of uh, death penalties and uh -huh. execution of the people. Uh -huh. So let's just say that the timing is a bit weird because uh, the, right now, thanks God, the this guy, Arvin Netanel Gahrimani, he's uh, not executed at least for a month before the next president will be accepted in the power. And Arvin was... Um, Everybody were try to free him, the whole Jewish world, and not only by power of prey, uh, because uh, yeah. um, to save this guy, even uh, Chief Rabbi of Iran, he was uh, speaking with many U.S. senators and uh, even found the contact with um, Neturei Karta, a radical Hasidic group that was uh, speaking with Iranian president, but it appears that um, Neturei Karta has no power. Wait, let's get this get straight. This straight. Uh, uh, Neturei Karta was uh, who they're anti-Zionist, and they were appealing for uh, the life of somebody. somebody who was was he a Zionist? Was he just he a Jew? Just he a was just a Jewish. He wasn't, he wasn't a Zionist. And, uh, and uh, Netari Karta were tried to appeal just because he's Iranian Jewish. Why is uh, Netari Karta involved? Are they involved with Iran because they're anti Zionists? Yes, that's correct. Oh, lovely. Uh -huh. Lovely. <laughs> But appears, appears that, that they don't have any sort of power. Appears that they are just clowns and everybody treat them as a clowns. So Chief Rabbi of Iran, when he went to United States, he was meeting these people from Neturei Karta and they couldn't help. How many people are in Neturei Karta? Like 10,000 in the whole world or? I think, less. I think less, I think less. If yeah. there is a hundred of them, it's a big success for them. And uh, yet they're high profile. We have to contact their publicity managers and see what their the, their secret is. We, we can, can actually invite uh, people, people from Netray Cart uh, <laughs> on the interview, <laughs> and they are very likely about to accept this invitation. I, w I would like that. I like the idea of inviting people who are absolutely in the opposite camp in the opposite direction i also like there's a there's somebody at the hebrew university who who says uh, israel does uh that that word that uh which implies killing people for their race and trying to kill all of them which is actually what the hamasniks are trying to do but somehow they've um uh, they've reflected it back on us I'd like to invite that guy and let's see what he has, what to, he has say. to say. I'm also, I'm also uh, but do you allow to 
they this work like to take the life out i'm not sure uh, i don't i i, uh, I, I, I have no clue um i have no clue i know there's a long list of words that are disallowed um but i don't know if they include the the g word or the r word or the b word all of the favorite hamas words actually is this is something very unique because hamas they are appear to be freedom fighters in the uh, modern western woke society uh, perception but they have nothing in common with freedom there is almost no freedom of press and actually i had one very interesting conversation i asked once uh, a guy who was uh, resident of the Palestinian autonomy, even uh, not the Hamas in Gaza, but just resident of the West Bank. Are you allowed to freely say something bad about the PLO, for example, or about Hamas, who is the current uh, parliament members and the ministers in Gaza? And they say no. And I say, no. oh. have you ever yeah. Take a look on the Israeli media. Like every single Israeli TV channel, they are saying bad words about current government, about current uh, prime minister, about uh, generals. This is something so interesting that in Israel, there is much more, the level of uh, freedom of speech is much higher than in any other society. Um, yeah, it's clear that Israel, to uh, an alarming degree, has freedom of press. Although uh, recently we just kicked out Al Jazeera because there's freedom of press and then there's simple and blatant misrepresentation of, uh, of obvious facts. So which Al Jazeera was doing. And, um, but it, it, to, to correct you, uh, Leonid, um, you, there is complete freedom of speech in all of the Arab countries. Um, the, what they don't promise is that you'll survive uh, for another <laughs> few hours after that. But, but it's it is free, um, and uh, death, after all, is uh, is a is a celebrated state of being. It's uh, like shaheed, everybody who dies for the cause. So even if you have contradictory causes, I guess that could be considered a shaheed. Uh, regarding Al Jazeera, I can tell you that actually. I'm not sure that Al Jazeera has no correspondence in Israel because they usually have uh, contractors and freelancers. So they are still doing their propaganda. And it's actually not only about Al Jazeera. For example, I attended recently as a journalist riots uh, for Bring Them Home, rallies for Bring Them Home. And I think it's already not about Bring Them Home anymore. I think it's about against the current government. Mm -hmm. So the only media that that I, that I see in there, there is no Israeli media, at least in Jerusalem. There is only Turkish media and, and uh, Russian governmental television, Russia Today, which is also could be the same way as Al Jazeera, very unfriendly to Israel. I that at these demonstrations, uh, the Israeli press is not present? At least, at least uh, on the latest one. I mean, uh, I would not say that they are not present there at all, because, for example, I wasn't on these uh, meetings in uh, Shabbat or in Matzei Shabbat. I've been just on some minor ones, maybe in the big major Israeli media are present. But at least in Jerusalem, uh, near Balfour Street, near Rehov Aza, there is uh, mostly Turkish and uh, mostly Russian media. I never see, except. That's a whole subject unto itself is uh, the question of the claim of the, of the Western press that there are an inordinate number of, um, of members of the press who were killed. Um, and I don't know, perhaps it's true. I'm sure that the concentration of press uh, in this war is higher than it's been in any war in the history of the world, bar none. And, uh, and if we were, we were to do, let's say, the number of press people per thousands killed, then um, this would be probably a th a many hundreds of times more. For example, there were, what, 400,000 people, uh, Muslims killed by Muslims uh, in uh, in uh, Syria, and 
there's Muslims being killed by, or, and also Christians being killed by Muslims in Africa, hundreds in of Lebanon. thousands. What? In Lebanon. In Lebanon also. And with all of that, there is no press there. There's nobody. It's, it's partially a matter of um, you, if you have a hammer, um, everything's a nail. And it's partly a matter of uh, searching under the, um, uh, the street light where you are. So if, you, if you're not admitted into Syria, then it's pretty hard to report there. And if you are admitted, or not only admitted, but welcomed, uh, and also welcomed as a human shield uh, into Gaza, then you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of you. But it's always been known that Jerusalem had a higher percentage of, uh, of media people from around the world than nearly any other place in the world. I can also say that this is one of the Hamas technique. They are trying to have coverage, like they are cover as a journalist, they are cover as a humanitarian employers, they are cover as a part of UN, uh, of different UN agencies. This is one of their strategies. But also what I can say you that right now everyone could be a journalist because in previous war, to be a journalist, you need to have a certain credentials. And now, if you just have uh, your mobile phone, for example, you can be a journalist. And um, I will not say that this is something bad, because this is how clarity of all the world events happen. But uh, it's very hard to, you need to have certain level of the critical thinking to realize who is a journalist and who is just doing propaganda. And also, I want to say that uh, many Western medias they are usually not using services of the journalists that are based in Jerusalem. They are much, much more likely will use service of freelancers that are residing in Gaza. Because let's be honest, thanks God, there is calm in Jerusalem. There is no bombings. There is no shellings. There is no air wave air raid alarms and attacks and of course media they want action because it's views it's uh visits of the so, so page yeah. so to, also as, as a bit of background the uh part of what drove uh, al jazeera to be cancelled from um from israel was that they were found to have hired um or maybe even hired in advance people uh, who were among the uh, few thousand terrorists that came in and um, um, it says go live it says I think it's uh, it's it's paused us so we have to start again no there is still continuation so I think it still goes to YouTube oh, okay all right so uh recording is already in progress oh okay yeah, i don't understand that okay i'm not gonna worry so what did they find they found that um not only were um um that that among the press among the uh people that came in uh to uh during the nova affair and on october 7th into the small uh, settlements that there were many journalists who were reporting live during the Holocaust, during that murder, during the beheadings and the rapes. And they were reporting it as a victory, uh, which is the way it was celebrated all over the woke and uh, Islam world as, a, as a, it was a celebration of uh, reclaiming uh, against the uh, colonialist occupiers uh, with uh, with untold violence and brutality, but nonetheless, it was considered to be a victory, and the journalists were inside. So, the, uh, some of them were fired afterwards because that wasn't considered to be appropriate. But um, it's a whole. It it not only is it a, a a merging of journalists with the general public, but it's also a merging of terrorists with the general public because if you see the films and if you see you know, the films even of current uh, wars in gaza most of the combatants are not dressed as military people and they don't present themselves as military which it makes it very difficult to know who you're killing if you're killing a, a combatant or a non-combatant so um that's one of the big problems and so a lot of the people who came in and did their rape and beheading and, and murder 
um, during the October 7th were not dressed as, um, and, the, and the ones who were, who were dressed, I spoke to a, a woman, uh, a nurse who was shot during one of the invasions, and she said that the terrorists who came in were dressed as Israeli army combatants. And the only reason that um, the Israeli soldiers became aware uh, that they weren't uh, Israeli combatants was by their behavior, I guess by their shooting at them. So all the rules of war, uh, all the rules of civil, uh, of, of civility, of, of the Geneva Convention and any other um, things that make us feel half civilized are uh, abandoned over and over um, by Hamas and their and their ilk. Yeah, yeah this, this is, is what, what I wanted, wanted to add, add that, that this is completely against Geneva Convention to be wear in the uniform of the opposite sides and uh, also to do such a diversion. And also, I would say like this, I saw some video from south of Lebanon when uh, Hezbollah used to treat Israel, treat Israel. Uh, they use journalists for it. Like, do you hear the sound? The journalists say, this is the drones that will soon fly to the heads of Zionists. And uh, these drones will use rockets and Zionists are not ready for this. So it was the direct threat actually to many people and uh, especially to Israelis. Regarding when uh, Israeli citizens will return to their homes, because they are already more than eight months in the hotels, Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, recently answered that this is not a good time to answer this question because the enemy is listening. But uh, right. many As people... That makes any difference. Many people say that uh, how it could be like not the perfect time uh, and who is the enemy? Because some people say it seems like the Israeli citizens who just want to be live in their homes, they are enemy for him. And they are what? Enemy for him. This is what many Western journalists claim. Like that. The, and, oh, I see. And not only Western journalists, many Israeli, like left wing journalists, they also claiming that Netanyahu, when he answered this question, uh that enemy is listening to our plan so we will not answer when people will return home uh they claim that this is unfair to all of these people but i remember the news that uh something like two weeks ago the guy uh who was evacuated to tveria he visited kiryachmana for the first time in 200 days and actually in the moment he was in his house the rocket anti-tank missile so was uh, hit the house. Thanks God he wasn't injured. And uh, nobody know what will happen. Like we still have so many fronts. We still have so many battlegrounds. We have Gaza, we have North. And if Iran will decide that uh, it's Israel who should be blamed with this catastrophe with Raisi, maybe we will have another Iranian shellings. Uh, that points to another basic problem which is that people may not be happy with Bibi, with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. And there are a lot of people all over the world who are not happy with him, but, and they're not happy with uh, the efforts to bring back the hostages. But as soon as we go in the streets and protest, as soon as Israel goes in and protests, that shows the enemy that we're divided uh, it shows that the government doesn't have a complete mandate to do what it needs to do. It has another effect. It raises the value of the hostages so such that uh, Gilad Shalit, how many years ago, uh, was traded for a thousand people among whom was... Including uh, Sinwar. In, including Sinwar, including Sinwar, who had been operated on for brain, uh, for a meningioma, for a benign brain tumor, and had his life saved, and cried to the um, to the to the uh, Israeli physicians. Um, so, as so as soon as we protest, bring them back at any cost, then Hamas is listening, and they'll say, "Oh, any cost sounds good to us. We'll release all of the people, all of the murderers, uh, all of the people with blood on their hands," and. We'll also use this as a proof that Israel is divided against itself. And 
one thing that the, the mystics are all completely agreed on, all the religious, not all the religious, but most of, I would say many that are uh, sincere and uh, have some sort of a, a, a bent towards understanding the importance of the unity of Israel. That's considered to be really our only weapon. That's considered to be, uh, we say that God fights on our behalf, but um, he fights on our behalf under, in two circumstances, especially. One is when we're united and the other is when we're in desperate straits. So we, I think it's a better idea to choose the former to be united rather than to wait uh, and fall into desperate straits. And actually, I can tell that uh, regarding any cause, uh, many people were surprised by American diplomacy, how America could promise this uh, releasing of the people with the blood in their hands. So many investigative journalists find out that uh, CIA director Burns and uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan, they somehow was acting behind the back of uh, President Biden and behind the back of Israeli delegation. They promised to Hamas many, many things that they didn't discuss previously with uh, Israel and with uh, uh, President Biden. So when Netanyahu called President Biden, uh, President Biden was quite surprised. He didn't know that this has happened. And uh, I don't know how uh, CIA, respected CIA Director Burns could uh, promise such things to release terrorists with the blood on their hands. But also what I can say that uh, I can see right now, no matter how people treat the current Israeli government, I do believe that all of them are united that on the idea, on the position that the terrorism should be punished. So terrorists should be That's in true. the prison. That's true. The, the only, only thing, thing they're they're not united on and which is really not even a point at all is that Gallant um, has said that uh, he insists that Netanyahu and the current government have a plan for the day after and which is I think kind of silly like you you know what's going to happen you know how this war is going to is going to evolve you know how many fronts are going to open up you know whether it's going to be full-on war with Hezbollah and the West Bank and the Houthis and the Iranians. Like, really, do we know enough to plan for the day after? Did, did when we were fighting against Germany and Japan, did really, really plan for the day after? I don't think so. And another thing, when we were fighting, uh, when, the, when the, uh, the allies were fighting for their survival in World War II, they were not supplying aid they were not supplying humanitarian aid. They were not concerned about how many civilians were killed. The civilians had brought in the government and supported the government unequivocally. And you're gonna bring humanitarian aid and worry about the civilians in a country where the civilians are used as human shields? Like, really? Like, wake up. So on this, I can tell that this is why we need to care about civilians and this is why we need to uh, evolve after World War II when allies didn't, provi uh, didn't provide any sort of help and didn't care about civilians because the world has evolved for these 80 years and uh, we, after the very bleed a very bad catastrophe uh, we survived we also valued human lives but what i wanted to say that i recently actually in uh, previous thursday got very interesting paper from the military censorship office and on this military censorship office there is a prohibition to say about everything about the condition of hostages about the day after about presence or absence of the day after and uh it's actually very funny it seems like the government doesn't have any plan of day after they don't know how many hostages left alive so they just wanted to restrict the talking about this to not making uh, to not provoke any social discussions you know when it's restricted to say about this and this is actually very interesting because before in the beginning we were saying about the freedom of press and freedom of speech but there is a difference between freedom of speech and uh, covering some uh, manipulative uh, theories that could make people more worried without less uh, 
evidence and less proofs. So army has a uh, restrict for everybody who is not familiar with any sort of information. Uh, and uh, I do believe that Minister Galant is familiar, so he is allowed to speak. But uh, this is that called like room experts, not like room experts like we are because we have some level of knowledge. I mean, people who just speaking in their kitchens or in their like backyards and they don't have any sort of information. They are not treating uh, various sources of information. For them, it's prohibited to do something without approval of the military censorship office. Also, it's kind of a funny thing when you have, um, if to think that you can censor anybody in Israel, considering that a large portion of the population, perhaps a majority, uh, considering how much cable TV there is here, speak a reasonable English, when some of them, many of them speak excellent English. So to think that we can censor, uh, but what I have heard is that the media in Israel were uh, tread much more gently on October 7th and showed much less dramatic pictures than were shown in Europe and perhaps in America, although I doubt that. Um, so that, that's one thing about censorship in Israel. The other thing, you brought up the question about the CIA. So um, the question is, is how long has the CIA felt uh, independent uh, of uh, the government? And uh, I, I saw recently a review of um, the JFK things. And uh, I think Trump said that if um, <laughs> that the CIA would have to be closed down if it was revealed what, uh, what he was uh, shown about the JFK assassination. So unfortunately, uh, or for better or for worse, you could say uh, to be more gentle, the CIA has been accustomed to manipulating uh, governments all over the world and conducting secret wars in middle Central America and South America and Southeast Asia and who knows where else without much of the guidance of the government and who knows what uh, what other things they conduct or refuse to do uh, to avoid certain issues uh, in the United States. So there is uh, a whole question about uh, just how independent the CIA is. And, and my, my question, question is not, not only about CIA, but any other Israeli security system, are they following the governmental instruction or they are also playing on their own? Because um, after the World War II, many like uh, League of Nations, for example, was reformed to the United Nations, which also seems to be not so useful organization. But after every war, we have a reformation of the certain institutions. And I do believe that the recent events, not only in Israel, but with uh, the rise of terrorism, rise of uh, Islamic State, uh, I ISIS uh, and other terrorist groups, rising of terrorist proxy of uh, Iran and private military companies of Russia, I do believe that we may see soon the reformation of the intelligence offices, not only in Israel, but right. in the uh, United States as well. And I can believe that, uh, like many things in the United States, uh, has uh, recently changed because historically it was governmental, but then it switched slowly to the more private sector. And uh, the same thing is actually came for post office. Today, post office of Israel was uh, privatized. It's already owned by the group of company Phoenix, mm -hmm. uh, which oh, is really? also an insurance company. Maybe the intelligence bureaus and intelligence services will be also one day private. Be, because huh. if it's already doing some separate things from the government, so it could be one day also switch to the private. But what I also wanted to discuss is uh, many people think that um, the future prime minister and the succeeder of Netanyahu could be the head of Mossad. Have you heard about this? The head of uh, Mossad that was before, his surname is Cohen, uh, he seems to be very active now. He gave lots of the interviews and he never gave any analysis how it's happened that 7th of October uh, was 
managed to make uh, managed to be i'm sorry for my english i'm very when it came okay. about 7th of october i may be nervous because it's still it's terrible tragedy uh but unlike many other people from the army or many other people from the uh, uh, law enforcement institution he never gave any sort of evaluation he said that we need to wait until the results of commission and uh I don't know. I'm not sometimes trust to the results of commission because we definitely saw what happened with the results of commission with the Miron Mount uh, on Wagba Omer several years ago when uh, lots of people got died. So let's just hope that uh, whoever, no matter if it will be Netanyahu, if it will be people from another political party, if it will be his succeeder, this guy from Mossad, that they definitely will make some lessons from it. The idea of keeping secrets until some future point generally comes out to be never or until the concerned parties are dead. Um, there are plenty of events. I won't say plenty, but there's at least a couple of events in Israel's history where it's pretty clear that secrets were kept. And until uh, Perez died, until other people died, they were, they were guarded. Um, and I think that's a that's a typical thing. But the problem is uh, when you say, oh, uh, since we're pursuing a war now, um, we have to uh, keep the motivation up and not show that uh, that we were weak. But the fact is that despite our weakness, despite uh, all the people who were in the streets saying that they wouldn't fight in the event of a war, um, when the war came, People flew in from all over the world. Uh, Israelis flew in to fight. And uh, the call-up was, whereas usually it's probably something around 80% of, uh, of reservists showing up, the result was something like 130%. So people are eager to fight. People are inspired to fight. People realize that this is... I just it's, wanted to add, people are not inspired to fight. People are inspired to defend themselves and to defend the country. They are not uh, inspired to kill. They are not inspired right. to fight. They are inspired to live peacefully and secure peaceful living. Yes, continue. Very important point. And we just saw in the 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 section of the of the Bible that we read each week, we just saw that revenge is forbidden. So, uh, and that's it applies on a micro scale. I I just heard a new expression called microaggression. So, micro revenge is also forbidden. In other words, if somebody, if your spouse, for example, annoys you, then you're not allowed to hold that, to hold a grudge even for 10 seconds or, you know, it, like you're not allowed to hold the grudge long enough so that it's going to influence your behavior. So that's quite a powerful, dramatic, overwhelming and uh, nigh impossible <laughs> uh, standard to hold up to. But yes, to influence, to uh, inform your point that it's forbidden for us to take revenge. Uh, it's also forbidden for us to allow people to kill us. And, uh, and uh, this brings me back to the story of uh, this guy, of this poor guy in Iran, Arvin Netanel Gahrimani. The whole world, the whole Jewish world is praying for him right now. The death penalty is delayed for months. Uh, during this time, uh, many billionaires from the United States and not only are willing to gather money to bring it to the family. I just uh, wanted to remind that two years ago, Arvin in the fight killed the Iranian guy because he was defending himself. The guy was bullying and the uh, punishment for this uh, crime in Iran is uh, dependent on the decision of the family of killed. So they might take a bribe just to not a bribe but some sort of redemption financial redemption or they want to demand killing right now they are demanding to kill and uh, even despite the amount of this redemption is raising every time they are still demanding to kill but maybe with a new president in iran who is not such a big supporter of the death penalties, it will be easier. So let's continue to pray for Arvin Netanel Kahrimani. And uh, this actually seem this is showing how beautiful is Jewish unity. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, bring up one point because you mentioned that uh, 
the, you, we, we have hopes who the new president of Iran might be. But as I think Carolyn Glick uh, has said, when you, or maybe the Ayn Rand people have said that when you, yeah, it's them, uh, when you destroy the leadership, you've just destroyed one layer of a very thick hierarchy and they're prepared with hundreds of people to replace him. And that's part of the fallacy uh, when it's said by people here and elsewhere, destroy Hamas. We just want to destroy Hamas. No, 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 no. That's not, unfortunately, that's, that's a fallacy from a couple of different points of view. One is that if you, that Hamas is just part of a larger jihad, they, all the elements of jihad, uh, the Sunnis and the Shias and the Palestinians, all hate each other and will, will will make sure to kill each other if they ever get enough control. Um, but uh, so that's one thing: is if you if you kill the leaders, then there's just more leaders to take their place. And people who were raised for 18 years and thickly educated by the UN, by UNRWA, in the schools and in the West Bank to hate Israelis and to believe that their holy mission is to destroy Jews and to destroy uh, Israelis and that that's how they learn their mathematics. How many, if I've killed a hundred Jews and there's 50 more, how many do I have to kill altogether? When you have a whole generation that was raised for 18 years on that sort of stuff, you tell me who the leaders are and who the followers are. Unfortunately, it's the whole population and it's proven even more uh, dramatically, uh, only 50% of uh, Gaza is pro-Hamas, but fully 80%, at least of the young people of the West Bank, are pro-Hamas and celebrated uh, October 7th. Yeah, and uh, regarding this, we would uh, actually try to invite experts on this. Uh, one of the experts is uh, David Bedin, who is dedicated his work on studying UNRWA study materials how in their school books they are actually glorify Shahid. And the other person that I would like to invite is the expert on Iran, because uh, it's very important to understand how Iranian people, Persian people are actually thinking. Because uh, what we have said that um, 50% of people in Gaza support Hamas, but uh, celebrates like as a victory much more. Uh, I can tell that yesterday I saw lots of the video that in Iran, many, many people celebrating the death of the Raisi. And according to this uh, expert of um, Iran, what he said before that every society is not mon uh, monolith. Yeah, so there is uh, some percents of radicals, some percents of uh, conservative people, some percents of, uh, let's say, like Hiluni secular people, and some which is like radically leftist pro-Western, because people like this are also present in Iran. Radically leftist is already not pro-Western, it's, uh, it's pro-Marxist. Yes, but anyway, and uh, this uh, is very important to understand how Iran and people are thinking so please stay tuned with us we hope that we'll do it more regularly we will supply you with more interesting conversations more interesting guests thank you for being with us all of these 40 minutes my name is leonid baratz i'm neil kummer look forward to seeing you in the future please press the subscribe button and uh, give us positive rankings on uh, wherever you hear uh, this podcast Thank, Thank you, you for, for being, being with us. us.